In this video, we're going to be discussing substance abuse disorder, specifically alcohol. So this is going to be a very high yield uh, video, some stuff you definitely need to know because it's going to show up on USMLE Step 1. Now, if you guys don't know, on our YouTube channel, we have a playlist that you can check out for psychiatry. So I highly recommend you guys check it out. And while you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. So let's first talk about alcohol. Alcohol is uh, something everyone knows about. It's a CNS depressant, and that's why you know you get drunk. You have uh, debilitating uh, side effects from alcohol, especially when it comes to your mental capacity. It's found in, you guessed it, alcoholic substances, and it's one of the most commonly abused substances out there. And it's mainly because of its ease of access. It's available practically everywhere and to a lot of people, and uh, its mind-altering effects. Both of these things combined make it very, very... Uh, uh, easily abused. Now, some things you should know is that alcohol is absorbed in the duodenum and it's metabolized in the liver and we're going to be talking about its toxic effects in a little bit uh, as far as the liver is concerned. And it affects the limbo, uh, limbo mesocortical dopaminergic pathway. Now, how much of that is going to come up on step one? We have no idea, but it's just something at least you can say you now know. So, uh, moving on, we're going to talk about alcohol intoxication, a.k.a. being drunk. Alcohol intoxication uh, acts as a CNS depressant, and it leads to people having slurred speech, them being uncoordinated and having an unsteady gait. Uh, coma can also occur in very high quantities, and we'll talk about that in uh, a few slides, as well as altered mental status. Now, all of this seems very straightforward, except when it's presented on the USMA Step 1 vignettes. It can be a little confusing because you may uh, misinterpret this for another drug. This is pretty much all the things you're going to be presented when it comes to a vignette for step one. Now, alcohol is measured in the blood, blood via a blood alcohol concentration level called BAC. And a BAC of 0 0.08 or 8% means you are legally drunk. Anything greater than that uh, means you are drunk. And that's also important for people who can't drive, uh, which is everyone, especially when they're drunk. Now, women get drunk faster than men simply because they have less total body water. Uh, so for a woman, three drinks might get her, you know, legally drunk, whereas for a male, it may take maybe four or five. So that's definitely something you should know. Now, alcohol abuse is different than alcohol intoxication. Alcohol abuse is defined as having a physical or physiologic tolerance and dependence. Okay, that's very important. You have to be dependent uh, as well as being tolerant on alcohol. And uh, withdrawal symptoms should present after a period of interrupted intake. So that is alcohol abuse, right? They're tolerant, so they need higher doses, as well as being dependent on the intake of alcohol. And without that intake, they're going to go through withdrawal symptoms. Now, alcohol damages the liver, mainly zone three. So let's just do a really quick review. Zone one is located near the portal triad, right? So that is the portal triad. And uh, that's going to be zone one, the parenchyma is going to be zone two, and then the central vein, okay, is going to be zone three, so nearest to that. This is where alcohol affects the liver, zone three. Everything else, mainly like hepatitis uh, viruses, are going to affect zone one because that's where the blood is coming in, but zone three is alcohol. Now, when it comes to biomarkers, you're going to have uh, two main biomarkers that are going to be increased. The first one is going to be ALT. ALT is going to be less than AST in this case. For most cases of uh, liver toxicity or you know hepatitis, you're going to have AST being greater than ALT. But in alcohol, we have ALT being greater. And the way I like to remember it is alcohol, AL, is greater than A. Uh, sorry, ALT is going to be less than AST. I just memorized this pretty much. That's a good way. And uh, it's it's greater than a uh, uh, AST is greater than ALT in a one to two ratio. Okay, so AST is going to be twice as much as ALT, but this usually returns back to normal in seven days. So after a week of drinking alcohol, you may not be able to diagnose someone 
with you know uh, uh, like uh, liver toxicity simply based off of ALT and AST. So what you need to measure at then is the serum GGT or gamma glutamyl transferase, whatever that stands for. Anyways, um, this is a measurement for liver damage, and this usually returns to normal in two to six weeks. So if someone who is chronically abusing alcohol uh, it gets tested for serum GGT, their levels will remain high longer than ALT and AST. And that should give you a good indication of whether or not someone has liver damage, liver toxicity at zone 3. When it comes to complications, uh, it's pretty straightforward. In the liver, you're going to have cirrhosis as well as hepatitis. This puts you at a higher risk of getting hepatitis. Uh, the pancreas uh, becomes at a higher risk of getting infected with pancreatitis. Uh, neuro symptoms include Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, something we talked about in a previous video, so I highly recommend you check it out. But we're going to discuss briefly here as well as peripheral neuropathy. And in the reproductive system, you can have testicular atrophy. And this alcohol abuse can manifest in many different ways. So we have alcohol poisoning, you can have withdrawals, you can have seizures, hallucinations, as well as the fear sequelae, which is delirium tremens, which we will talk about. So we're gonna be discussing pretty much all of these in this video. All of this is very high yield. It's very, very important stuff for step one. So let's start the conversation with the Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Now, we've done a whole video about the Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. It's located on the psych uh, playlist, so go ahead and check it out. It's more in detail than what we're going to cover today, but we're just going to get through the main, uh, the main details you need to know. So Wernicke-Korsakoff is a spectrum of neurologic diseases that are caused by thiamine deficiency. Uh, and in the next slide, we're actually going to be discussing how alcohol affects thiamine uh, in absorption and activation. But uh, it's essentially, in this syndrome, you're going to have Wernicke's encephalopathy as well as the Korsakoff syndrome. So what are these two main uh, syndromes or these two main uh, diseases. Well, Wernicke's it has a classic triad of ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and, and confusion. And usually Wernicke's will present before the Korsakoff syndrome. Wernicke's will then progress to the Korsakoff syndrome, which consists of amnesia, anterograde more likely than retrograde, confabulations, just making up things, as well as personality changes. Once you get to the Korsakoff syndrome, uh, it's very unlikely to be able to reverse the damage that's occurred. Now, the main causes for this syndrome are going to be thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency. Alcoholism is the main cause, right? Usually it's alcoholism, and we're going to talk about that. But for this video, make sure you understand that alcoholism can lead to Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, as well as just general malnourishment. Uh, just generally not absorbing enough vitamin B1 can lead to Wernicke-Korsakoff. Now, pathophysiology is pretty straightforward. Uh, all of these symptoms right here are going to be caused by decreased thiamine, uh, and this can lead to atrophy of the mammillary bodies, and that can cause all of these symptoms that we've been talking about in Wernicke encephalopathy and the Korsakoff syndrome. And this can also be associated with paraventricular hemorrhages. And the treatment for this is very simple. You want to infuse thiamine in a titrated fashion along with glucose. Now, why do you want to do that? Is because glucose normalizes thiamine. Uh, without it, thiamine is actually going to, uh, sorry, without thiamine, glucose ends up being converted into lactic acid. And that can lead to a metabolic acidosis. So in order to prevent that, you, you titrate glucose, uh, uh, you titrate thiamine, excuse me, with glucose like we wrote right here. Now, we are going to talk a little bit more about alcohol abuse and thiamine deficiency because it's really important to understand what's happening. Alcohol, as we talked about, gets absorbed in the duodenum and gets stored in the liver. So as you can see, it's a major cause of the Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, mainly because of the three mechanisms of action uh, that alcohol has when it comes to thiamine. So first of all, what alcohol can do is interfere with the conversion of thiamine to thiamine pyrophosphate. This is the metabolically active form of thiamine that is available in our body. Alcohol will block the action of thiamine pyrophosphate synthetase, which is the enzyme that activates thiamine into thiamine pyrophosphate. And by, uh, by blocking that uh, enzyme, 
you decrease the metabolic activity and metabolic activation of thiamine pyrophosphate. The other thing you can do, or the other thing alcohol does, is it prevents absorption of thiamine, right? Thiamine is, uh, sorry, alcohol is also absorbed in the uh, GI tract along with thiamine. But what it can do when it gets absorbed is it can block the gene expression for the thiamine transporter 1. So on one hand, we've blocked the activation of thiamine. On the other hand, we have blocked the uh, absorption of thiamine. And finally, alcohol causes cirrhosis. We already know that. So what does cirrhosis do? It blocks the storage of thiamine in the liver, right? Because of cirrhosis, the liver can't store thiamine, and that leads to a decreased thiamine content or vitamin B1 content leading to Wernicke-Korsakoff. Now, we highly recommend you guys watch our full video on the Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. You can find it on our channel uh, in the playlist for the USMLE Step 1 psych video. So go check it out. We highly, highly recommend it. So that is pretty much alcohol abuse and thiamine deficiency. We're going to now go ahead and talk about the different uh, types of presentations of alcohol uh, addiction, alcohol intoxication, and abuse. And the first one is going to be alcohol poisoning. Alcohol poisoning is a very, very dangerous manifestation of binge drink drinking, and it usually occurs when a blood alcohol concentration is around 0.2 to 0.3. Keep in mind that you are legally drunk, right, so let's write that out, you are legally drunk at a BAC of 0 0.8 or higher meaning at 0 0.08, sorry, 0 0.08 or higher. This is going to be almost 2 to 3.5 times as high as a legal limit of alcohol. 2 to 3 times uh, the amount. So that is what you need to get alcohol poisoning. Now, obviously, alcohol is a CNS depressant, and with alcohol poisoning, you can have CNS depression, major CNS depression, and that can present with respiratory depression. A coma can occur because of so much CNS depression, and it can even lead to death. Now, the treatment for this, unfortunately, is going to be supportive care. That's about all you can do. You can pump the stomach, and after that, you can just give supportive care fluids and IVs just to help the patient. Uh, and the patients are usually placed in the ICU to help them recover. Cover. Now, after alcohol poisoning, the next thing you need to know about alcohol is alcohol withdrawal. This usually occurs after uh, 6 to 24 hours or 6 to a day after the last ingestion. And it usually occurs in a very heavy drinker uh, who ended up uh, like stopping abruptly without actually tapering off. What can happen in this is that the uh, patient might present with tremors with a mental status being intact. So they don't have an altered mental status. And that's why I put this GIF right here of uh, Stewie just shaking, you know, having a tremor right there. This is very important because this is going to distinguish uh, alcohol withdrawal for something called delirium tremens, which we're going to talk about in a bit. But you can also have anxiety and insomnia, an upset stomach, a headache, uh, sweating and palpitations are also present. So these are all your non-specific symptoms that can occur with alcohol withdrawal. The main thing to remember is going to be the tremors with mental in, uh, status intact. Now, the treatment for this also is going to be very self-limiting. Usually, this will resolve within 24 to 48 hours on its own. You can give benzos if withdrawal symptoms are severe because it will improve the agitation and prevent the progression from uh, withdrawal to more dangerous uh, uh, forms of alcohol uh, poisoning like uh, alcoholic seizures, hallucinations, and delirium tremens. So that is alcohol withdrawal. Just keep in mind it usually occurs between 6 to 24 hours, presents with tremors with mental status being intact, and you can give benzos, although it's not always given. The next thing we're going to talk about is alcohol seizures. Now, alcohol seizures are very similar uh, to timeline for alcohol withdrawal, except that this is usually going to occur 6 to 48 hours after the last ingestion. So as you know, uh, alcohol withdrawal, let's just write this out, alcohol withdrawal occurs 6 to 24 hours 
this is going to occur 6 to 48, so you can definitely have seizures while someone is going through withdrawal that can occur concurrently. Now, when it comes to symptoms, usually this is going to be a single or clustered uh, seizure. Uh, in general, it's going to be a general tonic-clonic seizure. The treatment for this is benzodiazepines or phenobarbital barbiturate, uh, as well as propofol. Uh, all of these can be used to treat status epilepticus, and if it is un left untreated, this can uh, progress to delirium tremens. 30% of the time, if you don't treat alcohol seizures, it will progress to a very, very dangerous uh, um, manifestation of alcohol poisoning or alcohol abuse. So that's very important to understand. 6 to 48 hours, okay, general tonic-clonic seizures as the name uh, uh, suggests, and you treat it with benzos or phenobarbital or propofol. Very important, you must treat this. So after alcoholic seizures, we have alcoholic hallucinosis. Now, alcoholic hallucinosis is going to occur around 12 to 48 hours after the last ingestion. So we're progressing, right? So we had we had withdrawal. So let's just write this out again. So withdrawal occurring 6 to 24 hours. Seizures occurring 6 to 48 hours hours and then we have hallucinations occurring 12 to 48 hours after last ingestion now the symptoms are pretty straightforward it's going to be usually visual visual hallucinations like the gif i've presented right here for you guys but it can also be auditory and tactile and that treatment usually is self-limiting because they're going to end up resolving within a day or two on their own but after that if they don't uh, resolve they will progress most likely to delirium tremens. So with that being said, now we're going to talk about the feared manifestation, the feared consequence of alcohol withdrawal and, you know, alcohol abuse, and that is delirium tremens, also known as DTs. This is very, very dangerous. This can lead to death almost uh, a lot of times. Now, this is going to occur 72 hours after last ingestion. So withdrawal, if you guys remember, you know, just say it out loud. Uh, but withdrawals occur 6 to 12 hours. Then we have seizures, which occur 6 to 48 hours. You have hallucinations, hallucinations, which occur usually 12 to 48 hours. And keep in mind, a lot of these things can happen all at the same time. Uh, it's very common. It can happen concurrently. And then after all of this, you have uh, delirium tremens that happen 72 to 96 hours after the last ingestion. Now, this is the most severe manifestation of alcohol withdrawal. This is the worst thing, and uh, this is what we're trying to prevent when it comes to treating alcohol withdrawal. Now, the symptoms are going to be delirium with altered mental state. That is very, very important. This is probably one of the most highest yield things to take away from the side because remember, in uh, alcohol withdrawal, we talked about how a patient who's going through alcohol withdrawal might have delirium, but their mental status is probably going to be intact. That is a very uh, normal thing, right? Sorry, not delirium, but they're going to have tremors with mental status being intact. But in uh, delirium tremens, they're actually going to have delirium with an altered mental state. Other things that can happen are agitation, drenching, sweat, uh, fever can happen as well as uh, hyperactive uh, autonomic activity so this can lead to hypertension and tachycardia and death usually occurs from you know a few things hyperthermia definitely can cause uh, uh, death because they'll end up having a drenching sweat uh, this might lead to low electrolytes right because the sweat uh, electrolytes and uh, this can lead to the arrhythmias, so uh, that's definitely something that can happen and they can die from an arrhythmia, as well as a fluid or electrolyte abnormality, which also can lead to arrhythmia. So this is all very, very well uh, interconnected. 
Uh, so that is pretty much mainly all you need to know about alcohol poisoning, alcohol abuse, uh, and uh, alcohol withdrawal symptoms. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. In the next video, we're going to be discussing alcohol abuse treatments uh, just so you guys can have a better understanding of how you're going to treat alcohol abuse and what the drugs are. So with that being said, thank you again for watching. And you can find these lectures on your favorite podcast for free. Just search Mad Medicine and uh, we'll show up. Now go ahead and continue on to the next topic.